good? Aren't you glad he's coming? I don't know about y'all, but I'm glad he's coming for me. Man, what a mighty God we serve. I forgot what chapter and what book we're going to this morning. Man, I'm telling you, that gets me all excited. If I doesn't burn inside of your heart, something's wrong this morning. Can you say amen? amen? Man, what a mighty God we serve. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Lord, hadn't the Lord done wonderful already? Man, what a mighty God we serve. Man, we are blessed in this church. My goodness. Lord, have mercy. Good gracious, alive. Man, I'm telling you. I'm ready to sing, folks. Whew, man, I'm ready to sing. What a loving God we serve. Matthew 13, verse 1, the Bible says, Let's stand. We've got to stand now. Let's stand again. He's worthy. In verse 1, the same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things un unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed some seeds, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. When the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. This is our text this morning. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Dear Heavenly Father, bless the reading of your word today. Lord, use it in a mighty way. Save souls. Lord, I pray that you would stir us as you're saved to serve you more and more every day. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Verse 8 is our text. It says, But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. I want to speak to you this morning on this subject, the seed <clears throat> of the sower. The seed of the sower. In verse 3 it says Jesus is given this parable and he said, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Jesus is drawing a picture. He's drawing a picture in order for these people to understand uh, the principle that God is fixing to try to get across. And he draws this picture of this farmer that is going out desiring to have a crop. And here in the Delta, we can understand this principle. We can understand here lately the traffic has been going and everywhere you go there's tractors going here and there because farmers are taking seeds and they're sowing seeds. And the more they sow and the more they sow, the hope, the prayer is that fruit, that fruit would come forth from the seed. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know what's going to happen when they put the seed in the ground, but they put it in ground by faith and they ask God to bless that seed. And through prayer, through water, through fertilizer, through all of this, we pray, we pray that that seed would bring forth fruit. These people understood this picture, and y'all understand this picture today. As Andrew went in the fields in the last few weeks around us, he is sowing seeds and sowing seeds and sowing seeds with the hope and the prayer that God is going to bless those seeds and bring forth fruit. Well, God is drawing a picture here that there's a farmer going out and he's sowing seeds. This is not just any farmer. This is a child of the king. This is somebody that has already been saved, that has already had a seed planted in them. And they took the word of God and they got saved. And as they grew and as they ripened as a child of the king, they realized their duty to sow the seed to sow the seed. Child of God, may I tell you, we have a duty and an obligation to sow the seed. We have an obligation to be like farmers and to go out, whether we're at work, whether we're at school, whether we're at the family reunion, whether we're in another country, we're to sow the seed. 
seeds everywhere we go. We're to sow seeds to the white folks, to the black folks, to the colored folks, to the orange folks. We're to sow seed in every society. We're to sow seed in every country, in every nation, in every community. I'm telling you, everybody deserves the seed. Everybody needs to hear about the seed. And us as God's people, we've been commanded to go and to sow these seeds. And everywhere we go, we are to be sowers of the seed. And may I tell you, it's not the sowers that has the power. The power is in the seed that the sower possesses. May I tell you, the power that I have is not in this sower, but it's in the seed that I possess. I'm telling you, there's power in the seed. You say, preacher, what's the seed? In Mark's, uh, in Mark's gospel of this, he, Jesus said that the seed is the Word of God. I want you to know the Word is the gospel. The, the seed is the gospel. When we say we're spreading seed, we're spreading the gospel message. I want you to know that the gospel message is this fact. Jesus died, Jesus was buried, and He rose again the third day. And praise God, number four, He's coming again. He's coming again. That's the gospel message. That is what we are to sow. We are to get the seed out. And everywhere we go, we're to tell them about Jesus. We're to tell them that He died. We're to tell them that He was buried and that He rose again the third day. And bless God that He's coming back. That He's coming back. That's our job is to tell them. You say, preacher, that's not popular anymore. I'm telling you, the seed still works. The gospel still works. It's effective. I told you not too long ago, 2,000 students there in Little Rock, Arkansas, the preacher there at East Union got up and he preached the Word of God. You know what he preached? Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. You say, well, that's not popular or cool. Well, about 100 kids got saved. I don't know about y'all, but you can't get any cooler than that. Amen? That's the seed that he, that he died that he is buried and he rose again the third day. I'm telling you, the gospel seed is needed everywhere we go because the seed is the bread to the hungry. The seed is the water to the thirsty. The seed is rest to the weary. The seed is pardon to the guilty. Seed is love to the unlovable. I'm telling you, the seed is grace to the unworthy. I'm telling you, the seed brings liberty to people's life. It brings victory. It brings hope. It brings encouragement. It brings love. It brings joy. And it brings peace. What do, you do, what do you do when you don't know what to do for somebody? Just tell them about Jesus. Give them the good news message. There's not any more encouraging message or sermon in all the world that Jesus died for us and that He gave His life for us. That He left the glory of heaven behind and came to an old rugged cross and died for me and you. I don't know about y'all, but that brings me hope. You say, why, preacher? Because he's not like Muhammad or Baal. He's not in the tomb anymore. On that third and glorious morning, he got up and he defeated death, hell, and the grave. And friend, that is liberty. That is victory and that's hope. And this world needs to hear the hope of Jesus Christ. That's the seed that we're to go out and to sow. Now I want you to think about the process. As we went out and we witnessed this week, we prayed that God would go before us and work on the hearts. It's amazing how God can plow our heart. Before a seed can be planted, the field must be plowed. And isn't it amazing that when we go plant a seed that, that that heart is ready for that seed sometimes? Because God has went in front of us and plowed that seed. Do you remember when the seed was preached to you that God prepared you? The very song this choir sang is the song that prepared my heart, that tilled my heart when we shall see Jesus. When I heard Glenn Payne sing that song in 1997, 96, whatever it was, in Monroe Civic Center, it began to break my heart and my heart began to grow soft and the Word of God was planted and the seed was there. The seed was sown and as the seed was sown, the seed was watered. The seed was fertilized and bless God, one day fruit came forth from that seed. And one day that seed produced fruit and I met Jesus and I got saved. But inside of that fruit is the heart of that fruit. The heart needs everything that it can in order to grow and ripen. 
And there's nothing better to me than when I plant a little old seed, and I'm going to take a squash plant because I love squash. I like it all. But you plant a seed, and here comes a plant. And boy, don't you get excited when you get a little bitty fruit. You get a little bitty squash. And oh man, I'll never forget the first time I planted them. I, run, I ran home and I told Lacey, we got fruit. We got fruit. They'd get about like that and like that and like that. And then they started dying off. And they started dying off. Kind of got disappointed. Kind of disheartening. But after a while, the more I watered, the more I fertilized and gave the heart of that fruit what it needed, the seed began to do its job. And the fruit began to grow and ripen. And oh, one glorious day, we cut that sucker off. And we sliced it up and we fried her. Amen. I'm telling you, there's nothing gooder than fried squash. Man, I'm telling you, it was good to my soul. There is nothing better when you get out in the fields and there's fruit for, from the harvest. That the, the seeds that you sown is bringing forth fruit. Praise God for that today. Praise God for fruit. I want you to notice three things very quick, and we're going to go to the house. Three things that that seed does to us, the fruit that it produces in our hearts. Look with me in Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, the very day that we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts. And there is fruit in our life. There are things that take place within our hearts. And in order for us to grow as Christians, in order for us to grow and do our job as fruit, there are some things that need to take place. The seed, number one, produces sanctification. It says in verse 22, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. The very moment that you get saved, that fruit is produced of salvation. But inside of that fruit is a heart. And that heart needs everything that it can get in order to grow and to ripen. And bless God, as a child of God, that seed produces sanctification. The Bible says here in verse 22, But now being made free from sin, being made free from sin, the very day that I got saved, He set me free. The very day that I got saved, He broke the bonds. He broke the chains of sin. Those old sins that I walked in, bless God, He broke them, that I never have to walk in them again. Being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Isn't it a blessing the very day that you got saved filthy, undone without God or a son, that He saved your soul, and you never desired anything good, you never desired to go to church, you never desired to do right, but that very day that you got saved, there's a little old seed of sanctification within you. And I'm telling you, you had a desire to do right. You had a desire to be like Jesus. You had a desire for holy things. You had a desire to separate yourself from this world. You had a desire to come out from among them. I don't know about y'all, but I praise God for that desire. And I'm telling you, child of God, if fruit, if you have been saved and you're the fruit, there's a seed within you that is telling you, you have been set free. You, all of those bonds are broken. Walk away from that old life. Walk away from those old sins. I'm telling you, when somebody gets saved, not only do they get saved, but they have the power within them to change their life. I'm telling you, Jesus ought to change you. He didn't just save me. He changed me. And to go down and for there to be fruit, but no works. No results, no consequences. We don't see the fruit in work. I'm telling you, the day you get saved, you ought to act like a saved person. The day that you meet Jesus, you ought to follow Him and live a life dedicated and committed to Him. Say, why, preacher? Because He broke my bonds. He set me free. I don't have to mess with that old world anymore. I gave my testimony the other day to the, the Spanish people down there. And I told them when I preached Tuesday night, I said I gave my heart to Jesus as a 13-year-old boy. But as a 20-year-old man, I gave my life to Jesus. And there was a difference. 
There was a difference. But that seed was there the whole time, that desire to follow Jesus and to live a holy life pleasing unto Him. Child of God, I ask you this morning, are you producing sanctification? Are you walking after Jesus? Are you living a pure and holy life unto the Lord? Look in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Isn't the Lord good? Not only does it produce sanctification, but it produces spirituality. In Galatians chapter 5, man, the day that I got saved, there was fruit that took place in my heart. It said in verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affection and lust. There was a seed down in my soul that produced spirituality. The Bible says when you get saved, the Spirit enters into you and it brings love into your life. I'm telling you, child of God, there ought to be love in your life. The very day that you met Jesus, you met love. The very day that you met Jesus, you met the author and the finisher of love. I'm telling you, there wouldn't be love without the Lord. Child of God, if anybody knows how to love, it ought to be you. If anybody shows love, it ought to be God's people. God's people ought to be the most loving people in all the world. We ought not be hateful. We ought not be bitter. We, I'm telling you, we ought to love on people. We ought to love on people. Not only love, but joy. I look out here today and... man. Man, I'm sorry, I can't help but stand up and shout over there. When I hear somebody singing about Jesus is coming back, I'm telling you, all the mully grubs and all the depression and all that we have as lost people, when Jesus saved my soul, He put the seed of joy in my life. That no matter what's going on in my life, I can smile whether I'm on the mountaintop or down in the valley. I'm telling you, I'm glad that God brought joy into my life. Not only joy, but peace. Aren't you thankful for the peace that passeth all understanding? Oh, bless God, the peace that God brought to our life the very day that we got saved. I'm telling you, child of God, we ought not live in confusion. We ought to live in peace. There ought to be peace and harmony. I'm telling you, sometimes as God's people, we live like an all 24-hour-a-day Jerry Springer show. I'm telling you, drama on every corner. We ought to get rid of it, get the, get the confusion out of our life, and live in the peace. Because I'm telling you, the day Jesus saved you, He put the seed of peace in your life. I'm glad I can lay my, my head down on my pillow at night and have peace to know where I'm going when I die. Oh, long-suffering. I'm horrible at this one. Huh. I'm not long-suffering all the time. I'm not patient enough. Oh, but man, this one did me this way and this one did me that way. I talked to a man the other day and he said, Oh, preacher, this preacher did me this way and he did me that way. And this is what I did back to him. I said, boy, I hope that felt good. Oh, it did. I said, aren't you glad Jesus didn't do you that way? Aren't you glad God is long-suffering? Child of God, you ought to have patience. You ought to be long-suffering. Gentleness. I have trouble with this one too. I'm preaching to me. Gentleness. We ought to have a gentle spirit. I'm telling you, if there's anybody loving and gentle, it ought to be us. It ought to be God's people. We ought to be slow to wrath. Goodness. Man, I'm telling you, we ought to be full of goodness. I'm telling you, God's been good to us. God's been good to us. There's goodness in our life. We ought to live in that goodness. Faith. Faith. How do we get the Spirit? Faith. How do you keep on walking in the Spirit? Faith. Faith. Meekness. Temperance. <laughs> Humble ourselves. The day you got saved, there was a seed of humility placed within you. I'm telling you, we need more humility. We need more meekness. We need, need more temperance. Notice verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affection and lust. God's people have crucified the flesh. 
They put the old man aside. They've laid the old desires behind them to walk forward to the new desires because there's fruit. We put yesterday behind us to walk forward in the day and tomorrow. Child of God, the day you got saved, you need to be crucified to that flesh. You need to die to yourself. You need to die to your thoughts. You need to die to your plans. We got up there, or well not up there, down there. We got down there working. And if you've ever, if you've ever met Jeremy Valadares, I'm telling you he's on something. I don't know what he's on. But we got up every morning. We were out of the hotel 7 o'clock in the morning, back in the hotel at midnight that night to have devotion. Not to go to bed, but to have devotion. We live will stay up 30 minutes an hour having devotion. 1 o'clock in the morning, we'll see y'all at 6 in the morning. Man would go. Man the food. Whew. Lord have mercy. Man the germs. Lord have mercy. If you know me, I'm a germaphobe. If you know me, I'm OCD. And when I go down there, I literally have to die to myself. Because I don't die to myself. I won't pour myself into it. But I got to die to myself. And I just crucify my thoughts and my desires to fulfill what God told me to do in that week. And I go down there and I just bite my tongue. Every time I see flies flying around our food, I... Then women brought in sacks with raw chicken in them. Flies hovering. <laughs> Biting that tongue. Lord, help me. I didn't die. We ate him. We didn't die. But it was worth every minute. Because I was willing to crucify and die to myself and to my thoughts and my plans. And if you know me, I like a schedule. Hispanics don't like schedules. We started VBS 5 o'clock, about 5.45 we got started. Man, I'm out there pacing. What are they doing? We're going to be late. They're just having a good time. Crucify to your desires, to your thoughts, to your plans. I'm telling you, the very day the seed of the gospel got in you and you got saved, child of God, you got to die to yourself. you got to die to your desires. Look in Romans chapter 1. If you're with me, say Amen. Romans chapter 1. <laughs> Number 3. This seed produces more souls. Romans 1 and verse 13. The Apostle Paul writes, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed, that word purpose means be burdened, to come unto you, but was led hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. When the seed was planted in his heart and he got saved, it produced sanctification, it produced spirituality, and bless God, it produced more souls. When the gospel got back down in his heart and soul, I'm telling you, it got all over Saul. He got all over Saul that he became Paul. And he went out and he preached. And may I tell you that there was a lot of souls saved from one seed. One seed being planted in the life of Paul, in the life of Saul. That man got saved and met Jesus on the Damascus Road. Who knows, Brother Mike, how many souls got saved from the ministry of the Apostle Paul? How many Christians, how many of them Jewish folks you, you think were sitting there, look at that old lost sinner. He'll never do anything good. There's no good in his life, but one day on the Damascus Road he met Jesus. And he got saved, and Jesus cleaned him, and Jesus changed him, and that man went out and he started sowing seed. I want you to look back in our text. I want you to look at something very interesting. And this is it right here in verse 8. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit. That's salvation. Praise the Lord. But it doesn't stop there. Some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. I want you to look over in verse 23. But he that receives seed unto the good ground is he that heareth the word, understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. I want you to know that seeds produce fruit that produces seeds. When you plant a seed, the hope and the prayer is that you get fruit. 
There is no way to get more seeds without that fruit. Because one of the most interesting things is this. As I plant that squash seed, and it has a plant, and there's squash that takes place, and as that squash is doing what it's supposed to do and growing, when it becomes fully ripened, it will have hundreds and possibly even thousands of seeds within that one fruit. And it is amazing off of one fruit you can get another thousand fruits. Off of one fruit comes a thousand more plants that produces 10,000 and 100,000. Isn't it amazing? Off of one seed, how much you can get off of one seed? Child of God, off of one seed, off of one saved person, there ought to be souls saved around us. We ought to be out spreading seed. We ought to be sowing seed. I'm telling you, off of us and our salvation, there ought to be people changed around us. There ought to be people saved around us. I'm telling you, we ought to be sowing seed. And I found this out this week, and I was a re reminded that you cannot out-sow the Lord. You cannot out-give out God. You cannot outdo God. The more you work and the more you sow and the more you give for the Lord, the more you'll get back. I'm telling you, when you think you gave everything you got, He blesses you tenfold, a hundredfold, twentyfold. Isn't God good today? Man, I'm telling you, you come in here with your tithe and you're hurting, don't know how you pay your bills, but you bring your tithe and your offering to the Lord anyway and God just blesses it and He multiplies it. You give your time, you give to the gospel's sake and you witness and God just blesses. God just blesses. God just blesses. Isn't it good? Man, I'm telling you, there's nothing better than producing fruit off the seed that was planted in you. How many souls have been saved from you? How many souls have been saved and touched from your witness and your testimony? Oh, bless God, we went out one day, I don't even know, one day, Tuesday, we went out and we divided. We went all over the town of Tycho, Yucatan, Mexico. We went to knocking doors. Man, people running down the road on motorcycles and mopeds and everything. That little girl from Reynosa I was with, she was jumping out and waving and stopping them. Hey, let me tell you about this revival. Let me tell you about this Bible school. Let me tell you about Jesus. Man, we walked up and we have some, had some of the worst encounters. We had three drunks. And I'm telling you, that little girl, man, I would stand behind her any day. I'm telling you, she was tough now. And she stood up to those three drunks and she preached Jesus unto them. And we went out and we preached and we preached and we preached. And of all the folks we preached to, Brother Carl, you'd have thought there'd been a thousand people. But there wasn't. Because not all the seed fell on good ground. But some fell on good ground. And we didn't get every one of them, but bless God, we got some of them. And I'm telling you, there was fruit. There was fruit from our work and our labor and our toil. Ten folks got saved last week. And I'm not talking about ten kids. I'm talking about ten adults. One night a 75-year-old man walked out and got saved. Last night a 65-year-old woman walked out and got saved. I'm telling you the fruit. Man, they had Bible school and the mamas brought the kids and the mamas stayed. Boy, that's something different. They stayed. You know what they did? They put them in chairs and they preached to them. There was 30 mamas sitting over there. And there was one of them seminary students over there preaching. That first night, four mamas met Jesus. I'm telling you, the next night, I think it was two and two the next, we had two men surrender to preach, give their life. I'm telling you, I'm wore out. I'm tired. I'm give slap out. Man, I've ate stuff. Whew. It's tough. But it was worth it. And as I talked to Brother Al Valadares, 65-year-old man, he's coming in June. And I said, Brother Al, what would you like to do? He said, I'd like to go fishing. Do y'all fish around there? I said, yeah, a little bit. He said, I'd like to go fishing. I said, do you fish? He said, I hadn't fished over 30 years. I said, why? He said, I surrendered to preach. It made me feel horrible. And he said, Brother, you cannot outgive God. Child of God, what are you doing for souls to be saved? Maybe you're here this morning and you've never been saved. Maybe you're here this morning and the seed has been sown. And the, the I'm telling you, your heart's been tilled, your heart's been plowed, and the seed is there. And it's time to be saved. 
You know Jesus is speaking to you. You know it's time to be saved. Would you come forward this morning and let me show you how to be saved? Maybe you have a decision to make this morning. Let's do it today.